Well, welcome friends. I'm so glad that you are spending time with us again. We are continuing our series, Bestseller. It's an absolute privilege to have you today. If you are joining us from Potch or from Clarkson, we are so glad to have you. I'm sure you are enjoying the midweek Bible studies and just the course uh, with, with our books and in our groups. It's absolutely amazing. If you're watching from somewhere else, it's great to have you. If you do want some of those, those uh, just the links to the midweek course, we would love to get that to you and even some PDFs to you as well. So please comment share and let us know if you'd like to if we can help you in any way also if you'd like to give today it's such a privilege that we get to partner with god in the gospel and be part of what god is doing on the planet so we just want to encourage you right now just there where you are if you'd like to give any financial in any any way financially it's an absolute privilege and we thank you for that but we also want to commend you for putting jesus first and honoring him even when it comes to your finances i'd like to pray for us for god's word and then we're going to get straight into it. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is, al is alive. Thank you that your word changes us. Thank you that we can trust your word. And thank you that we can today learn how to get to know your word better and to, to understand your word better. Jesus, your word is so powerful. We open our hearts. May our hearts be, be impacted by the life of your word. Holy Spirit, make these words alive. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, I am so, so glad to be sharing with you today. Today, I want to talk about how to navigate the Bible. Remember the first, first session was all about how you and I can build our lives on the Word of God. The second session we said, how can we trust the Bible? And last week we saw you can really, really trust uh, the Bible. The Bible is powerful. And then we're learning during the week how to, how to have regular quiet times, how to maximize our times in God's Word. This week, even in our, in our times, in our groups, we're going to be learning about how you and I can, can grow in prayer and meditation when it comes to the Word. How can we maximize those Word times and how can we learn from God's word and let God speak to us, listen to God and speak to God in our times in the word, which is absolutely powerful. But I would like to just quickly launch with Joshua chapter one, verse seven to nine. Now Joshua chapter one is a key text in my life. This has been one of the biggest verses for my ministry and for our future, for our family. Us as a family, we, we're having to make some major decisions in our lives. And as we make these decisions, we're not bas basing these decisions on feelings or convenience or comfort, or even what the world expects, but we base these decisions on the Word of God. And in the Old Testament, they referred to the Word of God as the law. They would write about the law and the Word. It's, it's, a, it's synonymous because they often refer to Moses' writings. We're going to see today the five books that Moses wrote. And as they refer to the Word of God, they would often say the law. But it's not the, it's not the Ten Commandments only. It's not the Levitical law. It's actually the Word of God. And that's why Joshua chapter 1 is so powerful. It says in verse 7, be strong and very courageous. And so in a time of turmoil, in a time of uncertainty, in a time of challenge that we are facing right now all over the world, in this time, I believe that we need to be strong and courageous. Where do we find our strength? Where do we find our courage in this time? We're going we're gonna to be speaking about this in our next series, but where do we find it? It says, be careful to obey all the law, or you can say all the word of God, all the law of Moses, of my servant, Lo Mo that my servant Moses gave you. Moses was merely just a messenger of the word of God. It says, do not turn from it to the right or to the left. It says that you may be successful wherever you go. So wherever you go, that you might be able to be fruitful, that you might be able to multiply and experience success and experience increase, not because you are strong, but in God you have strength and you've got courage because it's in His Word. Keep this book of the law, keep this Bible, keep this Word on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. It says, when you will, then you will be prosperous and successful. Can you say prosperous and successful? Now, friends, I believe that this is not only financial, this is emotional, this is spiritual, this is physical, that God wants us to be able to, to experience His favor, His blessing, His presence, and that for me is prosperity. Prosperity is having the presence of God, is having the, uh, literally the approval of God, the being a, living a life that pleases God, and a life that experiences the grace and the favor of God. It says, then you will be prosperous and successful. Verse 9 says, have I not commanded you? This is a command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. Friends, what an amazing truth. That as you and I find ourselves in the Scriptures, like Jesus found himself in the Scriptures, as we find ourselves in it is written, as we find ourselves in the truth of God's Word, as we find ourselves in the revelation of Jesus through these pages, 
Friends, our whole lives are secure. We get strength, we get courage, and we find ourselves fruitful, and we find ourselves blessed. Friends, I remember how hard it is sometimes just to be able to navigate the Bible is hard. People don't know where to start. They don't know where to end. They don't know what to do. They don't know what they must read. They don't know how to, how to navigate the Bible. I remember moving to Johannesburg a number of years ago. And when we moved to Johannesburg, it was this big city. We were, small to kind of, we were used to kind of smaller towns. And, uh, and what happened was that we, those were the days before GPSs and before smartphones. I mean, I still had a Nokia. You know, I, had a, I had a smart Nokia, but it was a Nokia, right? So that meant we did not have GPSs. We did not know how to navigate the city. I got lost all the time. We got so lost one day. Marie and I, we had like, uh, like a little baby. Joshua was a baby. Joshua in the car. And he was screaming and crying and needing, he was needing some help and needing some milk and needing a, a diaper change. And so we were like, please, Lord, we just want to find this place. We can't find a place. We were getting lost all the time. We were so frustrated with getting lost that we found the first shopping center we went to a bookstore and we bought a map of Johannesburg, a paper map of Johannesburg. And then we started using this map in order to go everywhere. And we started getting less and less lost because we learned how to navigate this amazing city. I believe the Bible is like this amazing city and uh, you are going to get quite frustrated and you're going to get quite uh, kind of like challenged and sometimes discouraged because you don't know how to navigate it. It's this beautiful, beautiful amazing uh, reality that you and I can discover, this great journey of discovery we can go on. But if we don't know how to navigate it, we're going to struggle to maximize it. We're going to struggle sometimes to find our way and to benefit from everything that God's got for us. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. See, it's not only about when you and I get to navigate the Bible, the Bible helps us to navigate life. It says in Psalm 119 verse 89, it says, Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. So God's word is eternal. Like we said last week, you can trust it. Psalm 119 verse 72 says, The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. See, this, this, this word, this gift that God gave us is so powerful, friends. It's more precious. Friends, that map, that map, Help me to be able to find my way. That map helped me to be able to find my way. Without that, I would have been lost. I would, I would not have been able to live. I would not have been able to do what I need to do, do what, even get work. And that the Bible is like this amazing map for life. And if you know how to find, how to, how to navigate the map, then you know how to navigate life. And so today I want to talk about navigating this amazing word, this amazing Bible, the book that God gave us, the 66 books together, the Word of God, the living Word for our lives. Now you must understand, he says, this, this Word is more valuable than gold and silver. More valuable, that means, friends, when he talks about gold and silver, gold and silver is, is what people work for. Everyone works for gold and silver. You might get it in rands, you might get it in dollars or in pounds or in pesos, you might get it in different currencies, but everyone works for gold and silver. And so, so many people put a lot of their life, a lot of their energy, a lot of their effort into getting gold and silver. But the psalmist writes, he says, he says, your word is more valuable than gold and silver. And so friends, most people say, I can't spend time in this word. I can't spend time getting to know this word because I'm too busy. I'm too busy getting gold and silver for my family. I need to buy, pay the bills. I need to have, I need to have a house to live in, a car to drive. It's too hard for me, Mark. I it's too hard for me to get into God's word. Friends, the truth be told is without this word, we don't have life. Without this word, our family's going to suffer because this word is worth more than gold and silver. I want to ask you, is that true of you and me today? Is this word more valuable to us than gold and silver? So friends, you must understand that a Kruger Rand is, in these days, is about 1,600 US dollars. 1,600 US dollars, that means... It's, it's, it's about, call it, call it about 26,000 rand. 26,000 rand. 25, 26,000 rand. This, the, the, the Kruger rand, that's, that's one, one kind of piece of gold, right? And so, friends, the way they get gold is they have to mine it. And we, we're living in a mining area. But uh, in, in our country, obviously, there's, this, there's these deep mines. I know I've, I've been down a mine shaft 
of two kilometers, 2,000 meters. I've been down a mine shaft. So you can go very, very deep in order to get the gold. And so, friends, what I find is I find that you can get gold close to the surface. I've worked with friends, and we've got some, some friends we are trusting God for, for them to find the gold closer to the surface. There, there are gold reefs closer to the surface, but, but, but it's amazing that sometimes the deeper you go, the more you get. The deeper you go, the more, but it costs more. It means it takes more intentionality. It takes more effort in order to go deeper. And so that's what happens with most people. They don't understand that this word is like gold. It is better than gold, more precious than gold. And this book is a mine. It's like a mine shaft. You know, here in South Africa, we've got some phenomenal mines. We've got the seventh deepest mine in the world, which is almost three kilometers deep. You know, that's the, that's the gold reef, uh, uh, the, the, the um, South Deep Gold Mine, which is here in Gauteng. So it's, 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 it's one of the deepest, of, obviously the largest gold mine um, in the world at the moment. So it's, it's amazing. But I want to say more valuable than that. More, that gold mine has produced great gold. That gold mine, my understanding, is that that gold mine has got reserves of, of 32 million ounces of gold. So if you say that's, that's a Kruger Rand, times 32 million ounces by 24,000 Rand or $1,600. It's got, that's 32 million times $1,600. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. It's like a, almost 50, by my understanding, it would be like 50 billion dollars worth of gold in there. That's that mine. And the deeper they go and the more they work and the more they sacrifice and the more they're intentional and the more they value it, the more they get out of it. It's amazing how the more we value, the more we're intentional, the more we sacrifice, the more time we have to get into this amazing book, the more gold we get to mine. Please don't treat your Bible like just another thing that you need to do, another tech list. Can we treat our Bible as this amazing gold mine? This gold mine, friends, has to mean so much to us because it's so valuable to us. And if you want to go to your, your notes, I want to ask you today in your little book, just go to your notes. I'm so thankful for Steve Wimble and City Hill. And they, they've just simplified it for us. Right at the back of your book, page number 72, just at the end of 72, I want to show you how this, this word, how you can navigate it, how you can understand it, and how it's kind of put together so that you can get the most out of it, so that you can know there's different shafts in this amazing gold mine called the Bible, if you had to understand it like that. This book, remember, it's got 66 books in the Bible. 39 of these books are Old Testament books, and 27 of them are New Testament books. The way you remember uh, how, many, how, how many books there are in the Old Testament is three times nine. Three, nine is 39. Three times nine is 27. 27 books in the New Testament, 39 books in the Old Testament. There's 1,189 chapters in the Bible. And so we, when we look at the different books, I want to show you that the, the, you've got the Old Testament and then you've got the New Testament. And basically the Old Testament points to Jesus and the New Testament, Testament testifies about Jesus and expresses Jesus. Jesus is at the center of the Old and the New Testament. We must understand this, is that if you can draw some of the lines, I'm going to show you how the Bible is, is then basically, um, you know, kind of, this different shafts and how it's put together. So the first five books of the Bible are called the Pentateuch, which is the books of Moses. Moses wrote those first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And so they, they are kind of like seen as the law. They're the Pentateuch, the first five. Penta, five. Uh, Tuch is the first, the, 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 the books of, of Moses, right? So the, the, the teachings, the first five teachings, the first five writings. And then the next group so those are kind of seen as the law books. Then the next grouping of books, you find it's from Joshua right through to Esther. Right through to Esther. And that's that second grouping of books, kind of the second shaft. And those are the history books. And so you'll, you'll find it's, those are amazing because they, they tell us a lot about the history of, of Israel. And you learn a lot about history. And it's actually fascinating. I love reading those books. And then you get the poetry or the wisdom books. Now, I, I remember doing an assignment on the poetry books, the wisdom books. I've studied that in my theological studies. It's exceptionally hard to understand how it all comes together, but there are great books. We know it's Job, it's Psalms, it's Proverbs, it's Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs. Now, sometimes we don't fully understand Ecclesiastes. Sometimes we battle with Song of Songs, but they are poetry. And so, we, so you don't necessarily base doctrine on them, but you get great inspiration and you... And great truth 
from them. The next grouping of books are the major prophets. Now, they're not the major prophets because these are like the, the top guys, the A class and the B class prophets. No, they're just l larger books. And so that starts with Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. So these, these books are like the fourth category of the Bible. Then the last few books of the Bible are the minor prophets. That starts at Hosea and it ends at Malachi. And like many guys have said, uh, Malachi, if, if, if you were Italian, Italian, it would probably be the Italian prophet for Malachi. <laughs> but no, that's just a joke. It's, uh, Malachi is the last prophet in the Old Testament. And then when you look at uh, the New Testament, you find it's also broken up into five sections. Five sections, five different shafts, if you had to call it that. Uh, the Gospels, the first four books is Mark, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Is the, go the Gospels, the book of Acts stands alone. It's, it's historical. It's more like the history of the, of the New Testament church. Then you get the Pauline epistles or, or the letters that Paul wrote. That's, that's kind of the third section of the New Testament. That's from Romans right through to Philemon. These are letters that Paul wrote to churches. These are letters wrote, written about Christ to regions and to cities and to people, believers gathering in those cities. And so Paul wrote these, these letters, absolutely powerful letters, filled with truth, filled with the gospel, so powerful. Then the fourth section of the New Testament is the book of Hebrews. Now, the book of Hebrews, many people think that Paul wrote it. I don't believe that Paul wrote it, but I, I know that it was written. In, uh, there are many similarities between Paul's writings, but we don't know. So we kind of say we don't really care who, who, who the person is who wrote it. We know that they God breathed. Hebrews is God breathed. God wrote it ultimately through uh, uh, an author to the believers that were persecuted, the Hebrew believers that were persecuted in that time. And so then you get the fifth section in the New Testament. These are epistles, not written to specific people, but they're written by specific people. So it's James right through to Jude, and you find these, these writings. And then the last section in the New Testament is the book of Revelation. And I'm excited because our last se series, or our last session in the series, we're going to be looking at the book of Revelation. And so I want to encourage you, as you look at these, these different sections of the Bible, there's so much of Jesus that you can find in each, each and every section. But you need to understand how the Bible works together. It's not necessarily just a historic book and it's not written chrono chronologically. It's actually written with certain focuses in certain parts. That's why it's important, friends, that when you do read your Bible, that you trust God to try and read through the Bible every single year and that you, that, that you read, read through books of the Bible so that you understand the full context of the Bible. We'll, we'll unpack that more in our groups, but that you can maximize your times in God's Word every single day. And so you must understand that, that, that this, this Bible is really an expression of Jesus Christ. And, and it's, God uses so many amazing forms of literature to express his person and his life and the revelation of himself. And as God reveals himself through the scriptures, we get to know, know him because that's what the scriptures are about. It's not about knowing about God. It's about knowing God himself. It's about knowing Jesus. And so primarily, friends, the Bible is not just a, historic, a book full of historic facts, even though it's filled with historic facts. It's not just a book filled with scientific truths, even though it's filled with scientific legitimacy. It's also not just a book filled with, with um, just some prophetic truth, even though it's filled with prophecy. It's primarily a narrative, a story about creation, sin, and redemption. And God wanting his people, wooing his people, drawing them close to himself. That's what the Bible is all about. Now, if you want to understand how the Bible works, the Bible basically works around, it's, it's like a rail. Have you ever seen one of these rails? One of the tenants with, with us, he, he bought himself a rail on which you can put all these hangers on. So you remember when you've got a clothing rail and you put the pole on and then you put all these hangers on the, on the, on the, on the pole and then, and then basically um, clothes can be hung on these, this rail. And so the Bible is actually filled, it's actually a book that's got 16 rails um, uh, which, uh, uh, which, on which these books hang and so that, so it's so it's amazing how all the other books kind of fit in to these 16 books and so if if you if you understand how they all come together these 16 books weave the big story of the bible and then the 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 other books kind of fit into fill the gaps in between but these 16 books kind of fill the fill the, the just of the story of the old and the new testament and i'm going to quickly give them to you the 16 books are the following it's genesis exodus Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, 
1 Samuel and 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, and 1 Kings and 2 Kings. You must understand. And then Ezra. Those are the, and Nehemiah. Those are the Old Testament major books that basically speak about the narrative, the story of God. That speaks about the, the, that, the, that you can understand more about. It's about the stories. Like when I read 1 Samuel, I, I read about about God, I read about the story. And then, then when, you, when you read the book of Isaiah, you see how the prophet, the prophet lived in that time and when, 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 when this historical event was written, when the story was written. And then you find how the prophet fits in to the whole storyline of God. In the New Testament, you find Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Acts. Those are the major histo- like historical books and everything then kind of fits into that reality, the story of God. All the other books fit into that timeline. And so it's, it's not like, it's not, a, it's not a, a chronological book. It's actually God revealing himself through that. If you look at, if you look at these three major characters in the scriptures, you find Abraham, you find David, and you find Jesus, all pointing to Jesus. But three major characters, Abraham, God's deals with Abraham, justified by faith, redeeming Abraham, establishing a people for himself. David, this king that will be, through which Christ will be birthed. And then Christ is the culmination of of that, and so the central theme of the Bible, like I said, the focus of the scriptures and the, the is, is more of a narrative. It's the whole Bible, but the central theme of the Bible is Jesus Christ Himself. Jesus is the central theme of the Bible. If you want to know what God is like, if you want to know Jesus, go to the scriptures, and we're going to show you. We're actually going to release some some PDFs that you can get in order to find Jesus on every single page or every single book of the Bible, to find Jesus in every book of the Bible. And we must understand that, that the way we, one of the ways we know this is, is the disciples were on their way to Emmaus and they were quite discouraged because now the prophets had prophesied about the Messiah coming and the law has pointed to them. Moses and the law has pointed to Jesus Christ is going to come and they were expecting a deliverer and they thought Jesus would be that. And then Jesus gets crucified and then they, all their hopes are lost. And then they're on their way to Emmaus and Jesus appears to them on the road to Emmaus. And he says to them in, in Luke chapter 24, verse 27, he says, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them that uh, what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Listen to this, friends. Jesus Christ comes to them. He says, are you so slow in understanding? He says, what Moses and the prophets said, they actually pointed about me and they, they actually said, that I'm going to have to suffer and that I'm going to have to go through death in order to bring about redemption. It was prophesied, Isaiah 53. It was spoken. It was declared through Abraham's life. It was declared through Moses. It was declared. And now I am the fulfillment of all these promises, all these declarations, all these truths. And so these disciples get a glimpse of Jesus. Jesus opens the scriptures to them and their lives are never the same again because they get the fulfillment of the promise. Luke chapter 24 verse 32 says, And they asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Friends, you can know all that I said to you today. You can know about the minor prophets and the major prophets. You can know about the wisdom books, which is awesome. You can know about the Pentateuch and you can know about about, uh, the historical books and you, you can know all of these realities. You can know some of Pauline's letters and you can understand all of those realities in order to find the the nuggets out of the Bible and to get the most out of your Bible. But friends, if you're not going to sit with Jesus, if you're not going to walk with Jesus and say, Jesus, like you did on the road to Emmaus with your disciples and you opened the scriptures to them, beginning with the law and the prophets, beginning with the writings of Moses, speaking about the the historical realities of Israel, speaking about the prophetic promises, the minor prophets, the major prophets, taking the the, the poetic books and and Psalms and Proverbs and and even Ecclesiastes and and taking Job and and opening that up for me. If, If you do not open the scriptures within me, my heart cannot burn. But when Jesus opens the scriptures to me and I spend time with him every day and I say to him, Jesus, Please open the scriptures to me. I want my heart to burn again. I want my heart to burn as I start to find that you are my hope and my deliverer. I want my heart to burn when I find that you are my shield, my exceedingly great reward. I want my heart to burn when I I find that when I confess my sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us. I want my heart to burn when you say you need to live free. When I know the truth, when I know Jesus, I find life because Jesus is the way, the truth, and 
the life, the Old Testament friends points towards Jesus Christ. The New Testament looks back and reflects on the life of Christ. And as we spend time in the scriptures, can we say, Jesus, open the scriptures to us. Explain, speak to me. Your servant's listening. Can I be like Samuel? Can I be like Samuel? Let's say, speak, Lord. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Can I be like Samuel? Say, Lord, speak to me. I'm listening to you, friends. When you find, when you want to find Jesus in the, in the Old Testament, many people say, it's hard to find Jesus. I'm here to say to you, friends, the ark points to Jesus. When Noah built the ark, that ark speaks about redemption, speaks about man was lost in sin, but God made a plan and he, and he, and he built an ark. He used a, he used a man and, and this ark was is a picture, a prophetic picture of Jesus Christ coming to redeem mankind, keeping us safe from judgment. And when we are in Christ, we are set free. We are, we are kept safe and we get delivered from eternal judgment. Maybe you're saying, but Mark, what about the Israelites? How do I find Jesus' friends, the Passover lamb? Jesus Christ was crucified over Passover because he had to be the fulfillment of the greatest, the greatest festival that the Israelites ever celebrated was when they were free from their slavery, free from their oppression, and they were, they were delivered from, from, from Egypt, and they were brought into, the, into freedom to worship God. And the Passover lamb made it possible when they applied the blood of this pure spotless Passover lamb to the doorposts of their homes. For us, it's the doorposts of our lives. We get delivered from death and we get set free from slavery. And Jesus Christ came to fulfill. So when you read about the Passover lamb, you're not reading a historic event and says, oh, that's nice for them. Well done, Moses and Aaron and, and so and so for, for, for giving your first, giving, uh, saving your life. That's a nice historic story. Let's put it on the History Channel. <laughs> no, my friends. It's not only historically true, even though it is historically true. It's way more than that. It's Jesus revealing the Scriptures to us. Jesus showing us Himself through the Scriptures. We find him, our Passover lamb. When you look at the Levitical, uh, the book of Leviticus and you think, wow, Mark, this is so hard to understand. They, they're sacrificing and there's blood and there's festivals and there's, there's this thing and there's a scapegoat and it's, it's a high priest and it's the, the clothing and it's the, it's the holy place. Mark, how does that all make sense? Friends, the book of Hebrews gives us an understanding and we, we get to know that when we go to the book of Leviticus, we read about this high priest and we find out, wow, we have a high priest. His name is Jesus. He, he's not unable to sympathize with our sin because he was tempted in any way but without sin. And he went beyond the veil. He went for us so that we can be redeemed and we can be free. And like in the book of Leviticus, the whole nation was set free from their guilt because of the sacrifices that the high priest brought. And now we have a high priest that didn't just bring a sacrifice, but he became a sacrifice for us. And Isaiah 53, the prophet prophesies about this lamb that was led to the slaughter, this lamb like Jesus, and he did not speak a word. And even though he could defend himself, he did not speak a word, and he went to the cross. 740 years before he went to the cross, Isaiah prophesied about him, and then he fulfilled that prophetic word on the cross. In closing today, I want to say to you that you can find Jesus in every book, and I'm going to show you just a few things that you can find about Jesus. There's way more. But as you read your Bible, and as you spend time in this word, and as you allow God to speak to you, and as you allow, say, God, open the scriptures to me. I want my heart to burn. I want to build my life, and I want to build my life on your word. I want to apply your word, not only hear your word, but I want to do your word. When you come to the scriptures, will you find Jesus in every, every chapter, every passage, every book of the Bible? Let's go to this. I'm going to read it for you. It's so powerful. Genesis. In the book of Genesis, you find Jesus, the creator, the promised redeemer. In the book of Exodus, you find him as the Passover lamb, like we spoke. In the book of Leviticus, he's our high priest. In the book of Numbers, he's our water in the desert. In, in the book of Deuteronomy, he becomes the curse for us. In the book of Joshua, he is our commander of the army of the Lord. In the book of Judges, he is our judge and lawgiver. In the book of Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. In the book of 1 Samuel, he's the prophet, the priest, and the king. In the book of 2 Samuel, He's the king of grace and love. In the book of 1 Kings, he's the ruler greater than Solomon. In the book of 2 Kings, he's the powerful prophet. In the book of 1 Chronicles, he's the son of David that's coming to rule. In 2 Chronicles, he is the king who reigns eternally. In Ezra, Jesus Christ is the priest proclaiming freedom. In Nehemiah, he's the one who restores what is broken down. Isn't that awesome? In Esther, he's the protector of his people. 
In Job, he's the mediator between God and man. In Psalms, he's our song in the morning and in the night. In Proverbs, he's our wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, our meaningful life. In Song of Solomon, he's the author of faithful love. In Isaiah, he's our prince of peace. In Jeremiah, he's the righteous branch. In Lamentation, he assumes God's wrath for us. In Ezekiel, he's the son of God. In Daniel, the fourth man in the fire. If you're going through a fire, Jesus is the fourth man in the fire. In Hosea, he's the faithful husband. Even when we run away, even when you are unfaithful, he's still faithful. In Joel, he's, the, he's sending his spirit to his people. In Amos, he delivers justice to the oppressed. In Ob Obadiah, he's mighty to save. In Jonah, he's the greatest missionary. In Micah, he casts our sin into the sea of forgetfulness. In Nahum, he's the avenger of God's elect. In Habakkuk, he crushes injustice. Zephaniah, he is the warrior who saves. In Haggai, he restores our worship. In Zechariah, he is the Messiah that, that was pierced for us. And in Malachi, he's the son of righteousness who brings his brightness and brings healing. In, Ma in Matthew, in the New Testament, he's the king of the Jews. In Mark, he's the servant. In Luke, he's the deliverer. In John, he's God in the flesh. In Acts, he's the savior of the world. In Romans, he's the righteousness of God. In 1 Corinthians, he's the power of God. In 2 Corinthians, he's the triumphant one giving victory. In Galatians, he's our very life. In Ephesians, he's the head of the church. In Philippians, I love this one, he's our joy. In Colossians, he holds the supreme position in all things. In Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, he's the comfort in the last days. In 2 Thessalonians, he is our returning king. In 1 Timothy, he's the savior of the worst sinners. In 2 Timothy, he's the leader of leaders. In Titus, he's the foundation of truth. In Philemon, he's the mediator. In Hebrews, he is our perfection. In James, he's the power behind our faith. In 1 Peter, he's our hope. We preached about that. In 2 Peter, he is our purity. In 1 John, he is perfect love. In 3 John, our 2 John, he is our pattern. In 3 John, he's our motivation. In Jude, he keeps us from falling. In Revelation, he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's my King. That's your Jesus. He's in every book of this amazing word. And he's here with you today and he'll open the scriptures for us as we trust him. Let's pray together. Jesus, I want to thank you for your word that is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, that your word is alive, that your word is powerful and effective, and that we are, we are so grateful and so impacted by your word. And I pray right now, if someone's watching that's far from you, if you're far from God right now, would you put your hope in Jesus because he is your amazing savior. He's, he's mighty to save. He is Jesus, Yeshua, God of salvation. If that's you, Put your hope in Jesus right now. But if you are close to God like me, could you maybe lift your hands? Even if you're watching online, even if you're watching in your home, just lift your hands and say, Jesus, open the scriptures to me. Even when it comes to Moses, even when it comes to the prophets, Abraham, David, Malachi, whoever, open your word to me. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Friends, thank you for watching today. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for worshiping right now. Let's worship this great King Jesus and enjoy your book. Enjoy your journey with us this week. Bless you abundantly. Enjoy Jesus. Amen. Could you see me?
I see. 